thank you, Will, for the um, for the invitation, and um, thank you, David, for the introduction, and thank you all for being here. Um, I've been looking forward to uh, coming to this conference for a long time, and so I'm grateful for for Will for finally giving me an excuse to do it. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there in person to see all of you. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, fun with spring toroidal spring embeddings. Um, uh, those of you who have seen me give talks before know that my definition of fun involves a lot of math, um, there, but also hopefully involves a lot of pretty pictures. Um, feel free to post questions in the chat. I can see the, the, the chat window while I'm talking. Um, I'm happy to take questions um, at any time during the talk. Don't, don't worry about interrupting me. So um, I'm going to be talking about something that I believe is sort of bread and butter for, for this community, um, spring embeddings of graphs. Um, these, you know, there, there are hundreds, if not thousands of papers written on forest directed graph embeddings. I saw at least two um, papers earlier, earlier today that, that where force directed embeddings played a significant role. Um, but the, 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 the history of these things starts with this seminal paper by Bill Tutt that was published in 1963 um, called How to Draw a Graph. Um, and despite what the, the, the title suggests, this was not the end of uh, uh, graph drawing, but really the beginning, I think, as a, um, as a systematic study. There were earlier papers, of course, about how to draw graphs, um, but this was, the, you know, really kind of kicked it into high gear. And what Tut proved was something that is usually referred to as the spring embedding theorem. So here, I'm not giving the strongest version of the theorem that's known, um, but just for the sake of, of simplicity for the talk, give a reasonably self-contained version. Um, so um, you have a graph G that's a simple three connected planar graph um, and you assign arbitrary weights uh, to the edges that are all greater than zero. Um, fix a planar embedding of G um, whose outer face is bounded by a convex polygon. Then there is a unique embedding gamma equals of G that's equivalent to gamma, meaning it has the same face as the same rotation system um, and the same outer face not just combinatorially, but geometrically, such that every interior vertex is a weighted average of its neighbors, by which I mean the, the, the weights are given by the edges connecting that vertex to its neighbors. And as a side benefit, every face of this spring embedding is convex. So the intuition behind the spring embedding theorem is um, you think of the graph as being made out of springs or rubber bands, you nail the vertices of the outer face down to the background um, and you let everything else go free and let the system relax to uh, physical equilibrium. Um, this is um, not just intuition, but actually a way of formalizing the spring embedding theorem and, and turning it into an algorithm for computing um, the, the Tut embedding. So the, the, what you're trying to minimize is the potential energy in this physical system, um, which is defined to be the sum over all of the interior edges of the weight assigned to that edge times the square of the length of that edge. So this, if you actually made um, a graph out of springs or rubber bands, at least if you're doing you know, first, order, um, uh, first order springs, um, this actually is the, the, the measure of the potential energy in the system. And so if I want to compute the spring embedding, I want to minimize this potential energy. It turns out this is a, this is a convex function of the positions of the vertices. And so it suffices to set the gradient of the function to zero. Um, or in other words, take the partial derivative of the, the potential with respect to each of the vertex coordinates. And you get this very simple linear system where for each vertex u, you sum over all neighbors v of the weight of edge uv and then the difference between the coordinates of u and v. And um, both of those sums need to come out to zero for every, every in this case, every interior vertex. Okay. So here's you know, the, the, the 
example is the example that David drew for the Wikipedia article on, on uh, tut embedding. Uh, but by changing the different edge weights, you get um, different embeddings, of, okay? all with convex faces, all with every vertex being a weighted average of its neighbors. Um, now, on the last page of Tut's paper, um, he makes a couple of interesting remarks. So one of the last results in um, Tut's paper is, is that he shows a way of sort of simultaneously embedding both the, um, a planar graph and its dual using straight lines. Um, but he doesn't actually manage to, um, uh, what, he, what he actually does is he, he um, draws the overlay of the, the primal and dual graph. And then the overlay he gets convex faces because through the spring embedding theorem. But he asks here, is it possible to lay out both the primal and the dual graph so that the faces of each graph are convex? or so that the corresponding edges in the primal and dual graph are represented by perpendicular segments. And then the second comment was, um, what happens on other surfaces? Um, so I'm actually gonna answer both of these questions. Um, not that the answers are mine, they're from other people, but um, both of these, yes, we actually know the answers. Um, but to get to the answers, I need to go back in time. Um, so Tut was not the first person to think about graphs that are in some kind of equilibrium. For that, um, I'll have to go back at least to um, Pierre Varignon in the early 1700s, where there are some earlier predecessors. Um, Varignon was a civil engineer um, who was uh, studying networks of, of forces um, applied to ropes. Um, in, he published this treatise called uh, The New Mechanics or Statics um, from the project that was given in 1687. Um, and there's this lovely little example in that, that diagram, um, which uh, for those of you who have seen any computational geometry whatsoever should already be ringing alarm bells. Um, so what is the picture here? Um, uh, the, the hands holding the ropes that are uh, tied to the stakes at the top, um, this is something that in modern terms would, might be called a form diagram or a, or a framework. Um, in the, the graphical statics community in the 1700s, this was called the funicular polygon. Funicular meaning made of rope, polygon meaning having more than one edge. Um, so polygon was just their word for, for a planar straight line graph. Um, and then the dotted lines, um, yes, this is the dual of the, this graph. Um, this is a force diagram or what would have been called a force polygon at the time. Um, and um, what you're actually seeing here is um, uh, each of the edges of this dual um, graph obviously correspond to the former, um, but what it's actually representing are the forces that are being applied to the nodes um, uh, by the rope. Um, and so uh, for convenience, these are drawn perpendicularly so that you can see the correspondence. But what's happening is this orange line here um, represents the vector of force that's being applied along this edge here, rotated 90 degrees. And this cycle is showing that the force vectors at vertex D all add up to zero. And likewise, this cycle is showing that the force vectors at C are all adding up to zero. Um, this is uh, really quite a, um, a modern uh, achievement at the time because the word vector didn't exist yet. Um, you know, we had mechanics from Newton 100 years ago, but um, this way of thinking about things wasn't as mature as it is now. Um, and again, this, this, uh, this metaphor of pulling on things with ropes also shows up in um, the first slide of, of Katarina Bursig's talk, um, which you heard this morning. So zoom forward 150 years. Um, in the intervening time um, after Varignon, lots of people dealt with force diagrams of funicular polygons, but always where the, the, the network, the, the physical system that you're applying these, this analysis to was a tree. Um, Maxwell was actually the first person to recognize that you can do a similar analysis on um, arbitrary planar frameworks, arbitrary drawing, straight line drawings of planar graphs. 
Um, and so he defined um, this notion of a reciprocal figure, which is something we would refer to as, as a dual, but with the restriction that corresponding edges in the two reciprocal figures are perpendicular. Um, and you know, everything I'm gonna say um, for the rest of the talk about this, this reciprocal figures, you can think of either graph as the, the framework, the physical system that you're, that you're putting forces on, and the other one as uh, the diagram of forces. So um, in uh, Maxwell's terms, um, I'm, I'm not gonna describe the Maxwell, Maxwell's theorem in full generality, but just as it relates to Tut's theorem. So let's fix a straight line plane embedding of a graph with a convex outer face. Um, now I'm keeping the vertices fixed and I'm imagining changing the values on the edges. And in this context, I'm gonna call the values on the edges um, stresses or stress coefficients for each edge. So I'm gonna assign a stress to every internal edge. And this stress is e in equilibrium if every vertex is the weighted average of its neighbors, exactly the way um, Tut would define it. Now, Maxwell um, in his 1864 paper observed that um, if I have an equilibrium stress, for um, a planar graph, then it follows that I can construct a reciprocal diagram, which is an embedding of the dual graph where every dual edge is perpendicular to the corresponding primal edge, answering Tut's open question 100 years before Tut asked it. Um, and moreover, every dual edge has length equal to the length of the primal edge times um, the absolute value here is redundant in this case, but, uh, but times the stress coefficient on that edge. Um, this, only, this rule in this context only holds for the interior edges, the things on the outer edge. Um, it's weird and I don't want to go into the details. Um, but just like in Varignon's example um, from the 1700s, the faces of this reciprocal diagram certify that all of the forces acting on each interior vertex cancel out. So everything is in equilibrium. So this triangle here tells me that the forces acting on this vertex cancel out. This is perpendicular to that. Okay. The second thing that Maxwell showed is that if you have an equilibrium stress on a planar graph um, with all the stresses positive, uh, then the graph has a convex polyhedral lifting. So this means it's possible to assign, assign a z-coordinate to every vertex um, so that um, in three space, the graph doesn't all lie in the plane, in a, in a single plane, but every face lifts to a polygon that does lie in a common plane. And moreover, um, every edge, every interior edge in the, in the graph gamma lifts to a convex edge between those two facets up in three space. Um, I should mention in passing that both of these theorems are actually if and only ifs. Maxwell proved um, if you have an equilibrium stress, then you have a reciprocal diagram and a polyhedral lifting. Um, Walter Whiteley proved uh, the converse about 100 years later. Now, uh, again, um, when you saw this, you know, convex polyhedral lifting, um, those of you who are computational geometers, again, the, the red flag should have been flying and the bells going off um, because you've seen convex polyhedral liftings before. Um, this is the standard um, correspondence between Delaunay triangulations in the plane and convex hulls in 3D. Um, and indeed, um, Varignon's picture over here, which should remind you of the duality between a Delaunay triangulation and a Voronoi diagram, um, is the duality between the convex, uh, between a, a weighted Delaunay triangulation and the corresponding weighted Voronoi diagram um, in the following standard sense. Um, so I'm, I'm not dealing with, with um, standard unadorned Delaunay triangulations, but rather they're the weighted version. Um, which I've defined this way. So if I have a weighted point, I'm gonna lift it up to the unit paraboloid and then lower the point by its weight. Um, and then I can define this dual plane by projective duality through the unit hyperboloid 
Um, and then the weighted Delaunay complex of the points is the projection of the lower hull of the lifted points. And the weighted Vorna diagram or power diagram is the projection of the upper envelope of these planes. Um, the duality between the, the Vorna diagram and the Delaunay, Delaunay triangulation generically is exactly the same as Maxwell's um, uh, reciprocal duality between uh, form and force diagrams. And in fact, he proves it by doing this lift convex polyhedral lifting and using projective duality through the unit paraboloid um, uh, about 50 years before Voronoi did that. So we get this um, maxwell cremona delaunay correspondence. For any planar straight line graph with a convex outer face, the following are basically equivalent. And I'm, I'm hiding some many to one correspondences in here. Um, so given a positive equilibrium stress for the, for the framework that implies an embedded reciprocal diagram um, for the dual graph, it implies a convex polyhedral lifting, it implies that I can assign weights to the vertices so that that graph is the weighted Delaunay complex of those weighted points. And similarly, given any one of the other three things, I can get uh, all four. Now, if you've heard me give a talk any time in the last 15 years, you know that I'm generally not very happy leaving things in the plane. Um, I tend to play around a lot with graphs on, on surfaces. And so I'm going to add a little bit of topology um, to both Tut and Maxwell's results. Um, and, but I'm going to keep the topology fairly lightweight and use really the perhaps the simplest non-planar um, topological space you can uh, play with, which is the flat torus. So normally you think of uh, the torus as the surface of a donut, or if you've taken a topology class, the surface of a coffee cup. But um, I think it's actually more enlightening to think of it as the space that you get when you identify opposite sides of a parallelogram. In the case of the asteroids space, you're identifying opposite sides of a rectangle. You'll notice when um, an asteroid falls off the right-hand side of the screen, it comes back on again on the left-hand side of the screen. That's because the left edge of the screen and the right edge of the screen are actually the same points, same with the top and the bottom. Now, Lots of things that happen on a flat torus look locally, like they're happening on the plane. And this, 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 this intuition can be um, extended using something called the universal cover of the flat torus. And this is a tiling of the standard Euclidean plane by an infinite lattice of translates of the fundamental parallelogram. Now, when an asteroid goes off um, the right side of one copy of this parallelogram, it comes back on in the left side of the next copy. So every, um, every asteroid in the, in the flat torus shows up um, with a separate copy in each of these translates. Um, there's an infinite lattice of flying saucers being shot by an infinite lattice of spaceships. And the point of you know, sort of raising this and the, the right way to develop intuition about how to think about the flat torus is to recognize that is if you're wandering around the space, not leaving any, any markers behind, um, there's no way to tell whether you're in the flat torus or in the universal cover, um, which means that you can take all of the intuition you have about Euclidean geometry, and as long as you're only making local decisions, you can apply it almost immediately to the, the, the flat torus. In particular, the notion of a straight line planar embedding has a direct analog on the flat torus um, called the geodesic embedding. So um, a geodesic is uh, just what you think it is. Um, it's a straight line. Um, formally, it's the projection of a straight line segment in the universal cover down to the, down to the, the flat torus. And a geodesic embedding um, is an embedding where all of the edges are geodesics. Um, but you can also think of it as the projection of an infinite periodic straight line plane graph like this. So this is um, an embedding of the complete graph with seven vertices on the torus. Um, and it's the projection of this infinite triangular lattice um, in the plane. You, know, you factor out by the, the lattice of translations 
Now, if I want to actually represent these things in memory, I need a little bit more information than what I would need to represent planar straight line graphs. Um, for a planar straight line graph, this, in addition to the, the abstract graph itself, um, I only need to specify the, the coordinates for the vertices. The, uh, the, coordinate, the, the placements at the edges are just inferred from that. But to represent a geodesic embedding on the flat torus, I need a little bit more information. Specifically, I need something called the crossing vector for each edge. Um, and you should think of this um, as up in the universal cover, how many times do I cross the boundaries of this infinite grid? Um, or so in this example, I've got an edge from U to V. These are two different nodes up in the universal cover tiling. Um, I'm representing U and V, um, their positions just relative to that, their individual squares. But I also need to record that this edge crosses the vertical boundaries of the grid four times, and it crosses the horizontal boundaries once. And then the reversal, um, so this is annotations for the half edges or darts, it's not for the undirected edges. Um, so the crossing vector of the dart from V to U is minus four, minus one, and it's crossing the horizontal boundary four times, but from right to left. Um, this edge looks like a single edge, you know, a geodesic wrapping around the flat torus four times horizontally and one time vertically. Um, and this is how you would represent that edge by writing down the coordinates of U and V and the numbers four and one. So this is a perfectly reasonable edge for a geodesic embedding on the torus, even though it might look a little bit strange when you first see it um, on the screen. So um, there is a version of the spring embedding theorem for geodesic embeddings on the torus. It's been actually been proved several different times independently um, and with slight variations. Um, but the, the first proof and actually much more general proof that I'm stating here was by Yves Colin de Vergier in 1990. Um, and the theorem states, um, and here I'm gonna actually state the theorem in its full generality as I know how. Um, let gamma be any essentially simple, essentially three connected embedding of a graph on any flat torus, again, with arbitrary positive weights in the edges. Then there's an essentially unique geodesic embedding that's isotopic to the one that you were given, where every vertex is in weighted equilibrium and every face is convex. Now there's some potentially unfamiliar technical terms here. Essentially simple means that the universal cover, um, the infinite periodic graph in the plane um, that corresponds to gamma, um, this is simple. It doesn't mean the graph itself is simple. It might not be. There might be loops, as, which is fine as long as they wrap around the torus. Um, so this is a property of the embedding, not a property of the abstract graph. Likewise, um, essentially three connected means that the universal cover is three connected. And again, this is the property of the embedding, not a property of the abstract graph. And together, these two are the minimal requirements in order for a graph to have um, an, equilibrium, uh, an equilibrium embedding. Essentially unique is a, I'm using essentially in a different, different meaning here. Um, it just means that the, the, um, the equilibrium embedding is unique up to translation. Any translation of an equilibrium embedding is still an equilibrium embedding in the right equivalence class. So in particular, this means this version of the spring embedding theorem doesn't have any notion of the outer face. There are no vertices that are fixed in advance. And finally, um, isotopic means that the equilibrium embedding is reachable from the embedding you were given by continuous deformation. So this is a stronger theorem than just saying it's combinatorial equivalence. Um, you also need some notion of, of topological equivalence between the, um, the, the input embedding and the, the equilibrium embedding. Okay, so this is the theorem. Um, and so uh, how do you turn that into an algorithm? It's actually easier to explain the algorithm than it is to explain the result, um, because it's the same algorithm that you would use in uh, to compute the tight embedding. Again, you have um, an energy in the system, which is some now over all of the edges of the stress on the edge times the length of the edge. Um, and you want to minimize this energy function. It's convex, so you take its, uh, take its partial derivatives and you get a linear system. Where here, I need to make a small adjustment. Now, this 
um, this expression here in parentheses, this is actually what we call the displacement vector from U to V. This is the vector from when you lift up to the universal cover, the, uh, the, uh, from one end of the lifted edge um, to the other. So I've got the coordinates here, which are the variables in my linear system, and I've got my crossing vectors, which are um, constants, and they're just drawn on the left-hand side because it makes the, the formula cleaner. So you get something that looks like this. This is um, a, a, an infinite periodic spring embedding that was computed by, from an example in, in uh, Delgado Friedrich's paper, who was one of the people who proved this theorem. Um, and if I restrict myself to this um, parallelogram and identify opposite sides, I get a perfectly reasonable, lovely um, spring embedding on that flat torus. Now, all of the things that I've been talking about with spring embeddings and all of the things that we really need to talk about the Maxwell Cremona correspondence um, are all local metric properties of graphs. I mean, equilibrium means um, if I look at the edges coming out of a vertex and I take those vectors and I multiply them by the corresponding edge weights, that sums up to zero. This is an entirely local um, characterization. Uh, a primal and dual graphs being orthogonal. Again, this is local for every edge. I look at the edge of that vector and I take a stop product with the dual edge vector and it should be zero. Um, even um, being a Delaunay is a local, um, uh, a local property. Um, we've known since you know, Lawson's algorithm that um, a triangulation is Delaunay if and only if every edge is locally Delaunay. Um, and this property extends to uh, Delaunay triangulations on the flat torus, and in fact, to generalizes easily to weighted um, uh, Delaunay triangulations on the flat torus. Um, I should mention here, I'm, I'm, I'm citing Voronoi here um, because uh, when Voronoi was studying um, Delaunay triangulations for the first time, he was not actually studying them for finite sets of points in the plane, but rather um, sets that were invariant under, you know, lattice, lattices of transformations. So in a very real sense, the first paper on Delaunay triangulations was about Delaunay triangulations on the flat torus. Okay, so let's see, you know, just how much of this um, maxwell Cremona correspondence we can pull up to the torus as well. Um, so Delgado Friedrichs observed um, uh, in his paper on, on periodic stress embeddings, that if you have an equilibrium stress for a graph on any flat torus, then um, if you take the obvious map that takes the flat torus defined with one parallelogram and turn it into the, the flat torus defined by a different parallelogram, um, but you keep the stresses on the corresponding edges, you get an equilibrium stress for the image of that graph as well. So um, the being an equilibrium embedding somehow doesn't care about the shape of the torus. I can reasonably talk about an equilibrium embedding on the flat torus and just saying, well, all flat tori are the same as far as equilibrium is concerned. So I don't need to, to, to consider a specific shape. Um, but other aspects of Maxwell Cremona, you actually do need to worry about the shape. Um, so for example, when we talk about a reciprocal diagram on um, a flat torus, what we really mean is a geodesic embedding of the dual graph on the same flat torus um, where every edge is orthogonal to its dual edge. And I'm insisting here on the same because it, it, it's a little incoherent to talk about an edge on one flat torus being orthogonal to an edge on uh, a different flat torus. They're different spaces. It's not, I don't really feel comfortable comparing them that way. But this is what I'm gonna mean by reciprocal diagram in this setting. Um, now, um, with my PhD student, Patrick Glynn, um, we were able to show that uh, we can extend the, the the Maxwell Cremona correspondence in the following way. So first, um, if I have vertex weights that I can assign to the vertices of uh, a geodesic torus graph that make that graph the weighted Delaunay tri triangulation of its vertices, then there is a reciprocal diagram. It's just the corresponding weighted Voronoi diagram 
but and vice versa. If you find a reciprocal diagram for a torus graph, it is a weighted Voronoi diagram, or at least a translation of it is a weighted Voronoi diagram, and you can pull those vertex weights back to the primal. Um, pushing further, if I've got a reciprocal diagram, it immediately defines an equilibrium stress for the original torus graph so by taking the ratios of the primal and dual edge lengths. So I started off here in this example with weights of zero on all of the vertices. I computed the Bellone triangulation, pushed it forward to the Vorna diagram, and then pulled it back to get um, equilibrium, an equilibrium stress on the edges. In this case, I've only written down three numbers. Um, the one seventh applies to all edges in the direct, the, the shallower edges with positive slope, four sevenths for all the steeper edges with positive slope, and nine sevenths with all the edges with negative slope. Um, so in the Maxwell Cremona correspondence, this is actually an equivalence. If you have an equilibrium, then you uh, stress, then you have a reciprocal diagram. Unfortunately, that doesn't quite work on the torus. Um, you can define something that looks like a force diagram that, that certifies that all of the forces applied to all of the vertices cancel out. And it is a graph on a flat torus, but in general, it's a different flat torus. Um, and so maybe to, to, to explain what, what's going on here, if we look at the universal cover of this um, triangulation of K7 that I have here on the left, you get this, again, this infinite planar lattice tiling. Now, if I imagine giving each of these edges um, a stress coefficient of one half, um, this, this infinite graph is an equilibrium. The maxwell Cremona correspondence applies to infinite planar graphs. Um, and so there is a, uh, an embedding of the dual graph where every edge, every dual edge is half the length of the corresponding primal edge and primal and dual edges are orthogonal. And you get a graph that looks like this. And again, it's an infinite periodic hexagonal tiling, as you would expect. But the, the lattice of periodicity for this hex, hexagon tiling is different from the lattice of periodicity from this um, triangular tiling. And so that's what I mean by uh, this force diagram living on a different flat torus. Things don't line up the right way. On the other hand, we also show that if you have an equilibrium stress, um, you can always find a way of a, a, a multiplying it by a scalar and choosing a different shape for the torus so that on that new flat torus with that scaling, um, you actually do get um, a reciprocal stress, meaning a stress that induces a reciprocal diagram on that same flat torus. Um, for interest of time, I don't wanna go into the details, but, but you can find them in the paper. Uh, this, this computation is actually quite simple, uh, linear time, um, uh, no, no interesting math or anything going on. Um, and, and so if you apply it to this embedding of K7, where all of the edges have stress value of one, um, you end up mapping to this um, parallelogram that's the union of, of two equilateral triangles. And maybe not too surprisingly, all of the tri triangular faces of the embedding get mapped to equilateral triangles themselves. And you get a stress coefficient of one over root three on every edge. And um, the reciprocal diagram is uh, the dual tiling by regular hexagons and um, every edge in that dual hexagon tiling is perpendicular to and has length one over square root of three times the corresponding edge in the, the equilateral triangle tiling. That's as much as I want to say about the maxwell Cremona correspondence, um, except I guess to sum up, um, like again, we have um, a, an equivalence between four different things I, and again, I'm waving my hands a little bit because uh, there's some many to one correspondences here. Um, if you, if a geodesic torus graph, it's essentially three connected, has an equilibrium stress, then its image on any other flat torus has an equilibrium stress. There's some flat torus where the image of that embedding has a reciprocal diagram. And there's some flat torus where the image of that graph has vertex weights that make the image a uh, weighted Delaunay complex. Okay. Let's switch to 
um, another topic. Um, that's also, I think, near and dear to um, most of the people at this conference, namely morphing um, planar graph embeddings. Um, so again, this is a problem that has a very long history, in particular at this conference in recent years, um, starting with this seminal paper by Stuart Cairns in 1944. Um, so what Cairns proved was that if I have two equivalent planar straight line embeddings of the same graph, then there's an isotopy from one to the other through planar straight line embeddings. In other words, I can move the vertices continuously, leaving the, the edges as straight line segments and without ever producing any edge crossings or collapsing any edges onto each other, morph um, one embedding into the other. So this notion of an isotopy, this is just math speak for a continuous deformation where the graph is always embedded. Um, morph here, I'm gonna add the restriction that during the isotopy, all the edges are straight line segments. Now, uh, there's a lovely little footnote on the first page of Cairns's theorem that says, hey, you know, um, Steinitz proved a similar theorem that you can find in Steinitz and Rademacher that says, um, we know Steinitz's theorem says a three connected planar graph is the one skeleton of a convex polyhedron. And Steinitz actually proved that if I have two polyhedra that have the same one skeleton, you can morph one into the other. You can move the vertices in a way that the faces remain coplanar and it's the same combinatorial structure morphing from one to the other. This is the quote from Steinitz and Rademacher down at the bottom, the um, uh, um, continuity theorem for convex polyhedra. Um, and Karen says, wouldn't it be great if we could just use that theorem to compute morphs? Um, it would be true if we could just show that every geodesic triangulation uh, of the sphere, um, every straight line planar graph, is obtainable by projecting a convex polyhedron. In other words, what Cairns would have loved to do is apply the Maxwell Cremona correspondence. And it kind of works. So if the two embeddings that you're given happen to be equilibrium embeddings with positive stresses on the edges in the same convex outer face, exactly the system, that, the setup that we had um, for Tut's theorem, then we can morph from one to the other by linear interpolation. But, it, but I don't mean linear interpolation of the vertex coordinates. I mean linear interpolation of the stress coefficients. So I define the stress at time t to be t times the stress at time one, plus one minus t times the stress at time zero. At all times, the stress coefficients are positive. And so by Tut's theorem, you get an equilibrium embedding and the equilibrium embedding actually varies continuously with the stress coefficients. So you get a nice morph. And this exact recipe also works for equilibrium embeddings on the torus. And this was something that, uh, that was observed by, by Eric Kalendevert, our Eve's nephew, uh, along with uh, Michel Pochiola and Herb Vector. Um, unfortunately, this doesn't work all the time. Um, uh, Schoenhardt uh, showed that there are graphs in the plane that, that do not have equilibrium stresses. There is no way of lifting this, uh, the graph down at the bottom of the screen to a um, convex polyhedral uh, surface in R3, and therefore by Maxwell Cremona, there's no equilibrium stress. And if I embed this as a subgraph in a torus graph, that means the torus graph also has no equilibrium stress. Now in the plane, you can kind of fix this problem. Floater and Gottsman had this lovely observation that if all of the faces of your, of your uh, graph are convex, every vertex lies in the convex hull of its neighbors. And therefore every vertex can be expressed as a weighted average of its neighbors. It looks like the same linear system that we were talking about for Tut, but now these um, coefficients, gamma from U to V, those are now coefficients attached to the darts, the half edges, not to the undirected edges. And they don't have to be the same. So we've left behind the physical intuition of a spring that pulls in both directions. And in fact, what you're doing when you solve this linear system is, you, is no longer minimizing some sort of convex energy function. Um, but nevertheless, um, this system of, of linear equations always has a solution. 
um, its solution always describes a convex embedding. Um, and it varies continuously with the parameters. And so you can morph by linearly interpolating these um, so-called barycentric and coordinates, and you get a nice continuous deformation where at all times the, the embedding has convex faces and therefore straight, straight edges. And you might think, well, can we do the same thing on the torus? And certainly you can set up the corresponding linear system on the torus, the problem is that now this linear system doesn't have full rank. And this was actually true already for um, the, the spring embedding theorem. Um, to compute the equilibrium embedding, we set up a linear system and computed its solution and the solution exists, but there was a two-dimensional family of solutions that differed by translation. Um, and that means that the linear system actually only had rank 2n minus 2, even though you had two n variables and two n equations. So um, when the barycentric coordinates are symmetric, there's always a solution. And when there's a solution, even with asymmetric um, um, coordinates, um, it has a two dimensional family of solutions and those solutions represent translations of the same convex embedding. Um, um, that much of it still works. Unfortunately, not every set of barycentric coordinates has a solution. You can't plug in arbitrary positive numbers for these lambda terms um, and expect to get a solvable linear system. Um, so you have got a, a, a singular um, matrix on the left. And because of these crossing vectors, you don't have zeros on the right. Um, and so there's an opportunity to get something inconsistent. What's worse, is if you start with barycentric coordinates for your first embedding gamma zero, and you start with barycentric coordinates for your target embedding gamma one, and you attempt to linear interpolate, the intermediate barycentric coordinates might not be realizable. The intermediate linear systems might not be solvable. And in fact, in general, they won't be. And so as far as we know, no, we can't make the floater Gotsman, um um, interpolation algorithm work on the torus. So instead, we really need to go back and look at Karen's paper. So for the moment, let me focus on the special case of triangulations, which is what Karen's actually studied. Um, and uh, think about what Karen's actually did. So he started by describing something that could be reasonably called a pseudomorph. This is a continuous deformation of the embedding where vertices and edges and faces are allowed to collapse, but you're never allowed to create crossings. You're never allowed to invert any face. So if three vertices of some triangular face PQ are clockwise, then at all times, those three points must either be clockwise or they must be collinear. Um, and the basic um, ingredient in Cairns' pseudomorph is um, uh, an edge collapse. So you take one vertex and you move it continuously onto one of its neighbors. Now, the neighbor that you move the vertex to um, is constrained. You can't, you can't move to an arbitrary neighbor. Um, you need to look at the link of the vertex. That's the, the, the hole that would be left if you deleted the vertex. Um, and you have to lie in the visibility kernel of that link in order for, you, you can move vertex U around inside the kernel of the link of U without creating any, any, any crossings or inverting any faces. But as soon as you leave the kernel, you've created a problem. And so when you collapse you to one of its neighbors, that neighbor must be um, a vertex of this kernel. Now, um, this always works for planar graphs um, because of a lovely coincidence of two things. One, um, Euler's formula implies the average degree of a planar graph is less than six, and therefore there is a vertex of degree at most five. And two, if you look at the link of a vertex of degree at most five, it's a polygon with at most five vertices, and every such polygon has a vertex in its visibility kernel. So the case where the kernel is convex, the whole, the, the sorry, where the link is convex, the entire link um, is the kernel, and uh, you can collapse to any vertex. Um, this is a figure directly from Cairns's paper where he analyzes all possible non-convex polygons with up to five vertices, and sure enough, 
they all have vertices in their kernels. So does this work on the torus? Well, things start to fall apart pretty quickly. Euler's formula implies that um, the average vertex degree in a toroidal triangulation is exactly six, which means either there's a vertex with degree at most five or every vertex has degree six. And we've already seen examples of toroidal triangulations where every vertex has degree six. So then it's possible that you've got one of these, uh, you have to deal with degree six vertices, but then the other half of Cairns' argument falls apart. Not every hexagon has a vertex in its visibility kernel. In fact, there are, there are hexagons that um, have empty kernels entirely. Those are not going to show up as the link of any, um, uh, of any vertex. But there are these two shapes here on the, on the left of the slide that have non-empty kernels, and so they could, should, could show up as links. And so if that happens, we can't collapse that vertex to anything. And so it seems like the answer to this question should be no. Um, but in fact, um, uh, uh, Patrick, Aaron, Salman, and I proved that um, it actually does work. So I'm going to deliberately, in the interest of time, go through the next several slides very quickly. I'm going to leave out all the technical details. I may, I may not even uh, be doing things slowly enough for you to get a, get a good sense of what's going on. Um, the slides uh, for the talk are available. And there's a link on the Discord server um, and uh, maybe even available on the, the conference webpage by now. Um, and you can see the technical details um, in the paper on the archive. But basically what we, what we need to show is every toroidal triangulation has at least one edge that we can collapse. And we argue by contradiction. Let's say for the sake of argument, there's a bad triangulation where no edge can be collapsed. So we already basically showed that, that this must be a six regular triangulation just from Euler's formula. Um, and every six regular triangulation looks like a standard regular tiling, except the vertices are in the wrong place. Um, now, um, uh, an averaging argument shows that not only you know, every vertex link is a hexagon, but moreover, it's a, vertex, it's a hexagon with exactly two reflex vertices. Um, and then by, by case analysis, um, only two of those hexagons can actually show up. The one on the left that we call a cat and the one on the right that we call a dog. And hopefully the reason we call them that is obvious. Um, we label the edges by, according to the feline or canine anatomy as appropriate. Um, and yes, we actually do use these as technical terms in the proof. Um, the first thing that we show once we've done this analysis is that the triangulation cannot have, every vertex can't have a link of a dog. There's at least one cat somewhere in the triangulation. And we do that by showing that the nose of one dog cannot be the center of another dog, um, basically using geometric arguments about angles adding up to more than a circle. Um, and then by looking at combinatorial arguments and looking at the you know, corresponding uh, links in the reference regular lattice tiling, we argue that there must be a quote, straight cycle of vertices, meaning a cycle where if you wander into an edge through a vertex, you must leave through the opposite edge from the one you entered. Um, where all of the links are cats and all the cats face the same direction. Um, if all the cats face the same direction, this is the figure on the left, that means the cycle is always going from an eye to the nose, from the left eye to the nose to the right cheek, and then that right cheek is the nose of the next cat, and it goes to the right cheek, and that's the nose of the next cat, and you go to the right cheek, um, or swap left and right. But because all the cats are facing the same direction, the total turning angle of this um, cycle is not zero you're consistently either always turning to the left or always turning to the right. On the other hand, because the cycle is straight, it's isotopic to closed geodesic, um, uh, and it's non-contractible. And total turning angle is an isotopy invariant, and so its turning angle must actually be zero. So we've, shown, we've derived the cycle that whose turning angle is both not zero and zero, and so we have a contradiction. So bad triangulations don't exist. Every edge can be collapsed. Every triangulation on the torus has at least one collapsible edge. So now we can go back to Cairns's algorithm. Um, and uh, he said, well, here's what we'd love to be able to do. I'd like to be able to take my source and target triangulations. 
and find an edge that I can collapse the same way in both. I collapse u to v in gamma zero and I collapse u to v in gamma one. And this leaves me with two simpler planar triangulations, which I can delegate to the recursion ferry. Um, unfortunately, uh, this may not work. It's true that there's always a vertex U that's collapsible in both triangulations, but it may not be collapsible along the same edges. Um, and so this, this simple recipe doesn't work. And now there's a long series of papers dealing with this exact issue that either you set up intermediate results in the middle and you recurse on two different, you know, two different sub problems or you very carefully move the vertices around so that you can collapse the same edges on both sides. We're going to avoid all of that, um, uh, all of that and instead use spring embeddings to handle this problem. So um, instead of aiming directly for gamma one, I'm going to describe a pseudomorph from gamma zero to the equilibrium triangulation in the isotopy class of gamma zero and gamma one. Um, and going from gamma zero, the way I'm going to simplify that is by using um, a standard edge collapse, exactly the way that Cairns did it. But I'm going to do something different on the other side. I'm going to exploit the fact that gamma equals is an equilibrium embedding, and I'm going to do something called a spring collapse. And a spring collapse, what this means is I take the stress coefficient on that edge and I increase it to infinity and continuously maintain the equilibrium embedding. Now setting uh, the spring constant to infinity brings those edges together and combinatorially has exactly the same effect as collapsing that edge. But all of the other vertices of the graph also move. But something that I was really surprised not to have known before we started doing this, and I still don't have a reference for it. I'd love to, to that somebody would tell me one. As you collapse this edge by increasing its spring constant to infinity, every other vertex moves, but every other vertex moves along a geodesic parallel to the edge that you're collapsing. Um, this is a simple exercise in linear algebra. Um, uh, it, it's just a few lines, but um, this is actually an extremely powerful tool. And the, the same thing actually holds, by the way, for um, equilibrium um, embeddings in the plane. Um, so the, what the, what this means is the fact that, um, sorry, the fact that you're, um, moving along these parallel, parallel geodesics is actually important later on when we perturb this thing, uh, the pseudomorph into a proper morph. So we can construct a pseudomorph between these two toroidal triangulations and they consist of a linear number of parallel linear morphing steps. We pseudomorph to the equilibrium and then pseudomorph backwards to the target. Um, we can compute these things reasonably quickly. The hard part is actually computing the spring embedding when we do the collapse, the spring collapses. So we end up with a running time that's slightly super quadratic, um, which matches the running time of the best planar morphing algorithms, which use spring embeddings in a different way. If we want to get a proper morph, um, we apply the method that's, that's described in this 2019 paper that has 13 different authors. So everyone who's on the Zoom talk is probably a co-author on this paper. Um, but there's a description in there of how to um, modify um, a, a pseudomorph consisting of parallel linear morphing steps into a proper morph. It's described in a more restrictive setting where you're only dealing with degree five vertices and you're only dealing with standard collapses, but adjusting them um, to uh, the um, uh, to this more general setting is is reasonably straightforward. And then the 2019 is for the the journal version. Patrick points out in the chat that um, this was described in a conference paper in 2017. And finally, we can generalize from triangulations to um, more general graphs. I do need them to be essentially three connected. Um, if we want to morph between isotopic, essentially three connected torus graphs, and we triangulate each of these two graphs, and we may not be able to triangulate them the same way. Um, and so we can't, don't immediately get a reduction to the triangular morphing um, problem, but um, that's okay. We'll, we'll take this intermediate uh, um, equilibrium embedding, 
um, and we'll triangulate it twice, once in a way that's combinatorially equivalent to T0, and once in a way that's combinatorially equivalent to T1, and we'll give all of the added new diagonals stress zero, which means adding these new edges is not going to affect the equilibrium embedding of the original edges. And now we morph between T0 and the equilibrium triangulation T0 equals, and then we morph between T1 equals back to the original triangulation T1, and then just erase the diagonals. And this, again, gives us a morph from gamma zero to the joint equilibrium embedding and then to gamma one. Um, and again, exactly the same recipe also works for morphing three connected planar graphs. Now, um, uh, so in the end, um, given two isotopic, essentially three connected geodesic embeddings, we can give it a morph. It consists of a linear number of linear morphing steps and we can compute it in a reasonable amount of time. Um, uh, I believe we're running a little bit short on time. So um, rather than recite the list of open problems, um, I'll leave this slide up on the screen um, and I'll uh, pause here and, and uh, see if there are any questions. Uh, thanks. So I have a question, actually. Yes. Uh, what, if anything, is known about geodesic embeddings on surfaces of convex polyhedra? Um, that's a very good question. I have to say, I don't know. Um, so Colin de Verdier's extension of Tut's theorem, um, he actually proves this not only for the flat torus, but for any surface with any metric that is never that never has positive curvature. Um, so when you're embedding on a convex polyhedron, um, you've got more or less by definition positive curvature at the vertices, and that's going to screw things up. Yeah. Um, uh, so I don't know what extends there. Okay. Now, if you're willing to change the metric, you can think of this as an ideal polyhedron and hyperbolic space or something and use that metric and then things will work but that's probably not the direction you mean uh i am actually also interested in ideal polyhedra but i meant i meant euclidean yeah. okay. um uh there's a question from Walter in the in the chat um the animations go through a canonical equilibrium drawing is there a notion of monotonicity um as their direct natural morph between the two drawings. So um, right now, I don't, we don't know. Um, the, the, so the morphs that we get are a little bit frustrating in that like Cairn's original morphs, you end up collapsing everything almost down to a single vertex and then re-expanding it out. Whereas what you'd like is to kind of monotonically move from one to the other um, in a way that the floater gotsman algorithm um, does for planar graphs. Um, we're kind of trying to figure out if we, if there's a way of adjusting the floater Gottsman algorithm, maybe by being a little bit more careful about how we're choosing the, the, the coordinates. And then we would get, if we could successfully do that, then we'd get something that is a little bit more direct, um, and maybe closer to what you mean by monotonicity. Um, we don't have things like, um, the sort of, uh, convexity increasing um, morphs that have come out by, um, uh, I believe this was the paper by Kleist and others, um, that under the hood use a theorem by Hong uh, Nagamochi, which under the hood uses the floater uh, Gottsman um, barycentric coordinates interpolation. So the fact that we don't have this barycentric interpolation means there are a lot of tools um, that we have available in the planar setting that we don't know how to generalize to the torus yet. Um, Andre asks in the chat, um, you mentioned that the reciprocal diagram might need a different flat torus. Can you always find a set of stress weights such that the two flat tori coincide? Um, so, um, um, you can always find a set of stress weights and a shape for the flat torus. But if you specify the shape and, and you require the shape of the torus to stay the same, then there are e graphs that have equilibrium stresses, but no equilibrium stress leads to a reciprocal diagram on that flat torus. 
Um, there's a simple example um, in the paper for the square flat torus. It's actually just one vertex with three edges. Um, but yeah, so the, an the answer there is it, you really need the flexibility in the torus in order to establish reciprocality um, from an equilibrium stress. Any other questions? Well, if not, um, thank you again um, for your attention. Um, please enjoy the rest of the conference. Jeff, Anna has a question. Oh, I'm sorry, Anna. Um, is there any analog of Schneider embeddings on the torus? Um, there are, uh, there is a generalization of uh, Schneider Woods. Uh, I, I can't go back for some reason to the previous slide. There, hang on. I don't know why this isn't working. Um, uh, so there is a generalization of Schneider Woods to the torus. Um, and so you might reasonably ask whether the morphing algorithms that navigate between different weighted Schneider embeddings are for planar graphs generalize. Um, unfortunately, I suspect the answer is no, um, because um, in the plane, different Schneider Wood, the different Schneider Woods for planar triangulation form a distributive lattice. And that does not hold for Schneider Woods um, for graphs on the torus, at least as they're defined by um, Gonsalves and Levesque. Um, so the, some other idea is gonna be required to navigate between those, those uh, um, Schneider embeddings. Okay, well, thanks Jeff for a nice talk. Okay. And, um, I guess Thank we have a break. So we'll have a break now. I think um, and come back at 11.30 for the next session. It's in about 10 minutes or so. Uh, thanks very much, Jeff. That was a really, really great talk. It was uh, fun, fun to see. Um, and I'm gonna stop recording.